So we're live now, Professor Bolabash. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Bela Bolobaj from Cambridge and Memphis, and I should like to welcome you to the third lecture in room six. This lecture will be in section 18 on stochastic and differential modeling. Our speaker, Professor Jacob Bedrosian from the University of Maryland, has distinguished himself by attacking and solving extremely important and difficult problems. In particular, in 2022, he has already published four wonderful papers with Blumenthal and Panshan Smith. These long and very influential papers have appeared in some of the very best journals in mathematics. I'm happy to see that one of these papers is on the bachelor spectrum of passive scalar turbulence in stochastic fluid mechanics, because George Bachelor was a long time head of the Department of Applied Mathematics and theoretical physics in Cambridge, and one of my colleagues in Trinity College. Now, uh, 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 although I hope there will be questions, these questions should be asked using the Discord link, and I hope then at the end of the lecture, Professor Bedrosian can uh, reply to these questions. So ladies and gentlemen, let me call upon Professor Jacob Bedrosian to deliver his lecture lower bounds on the top Yapunov exponent of stochastic systems. Okay, thanks a lot for, oh, for the really nice introduction. And um, thank you to the organizers and to the IMU for being able to make uh, this happen and have us to have some in-person interaction even with the, the issues with the, with the war. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, be talking about some work um, with uh, Alex and Sam. So Alex is at Georgia Tech and Sam, uh, after a brief stay at the IAS, is now at, in Tulane. Uh, but I will not be talking about the bachelor spectrum. I'll talk about something else. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, this talk will be about chaos, but as sensitivity with respect to initial conditions. So what I mean to say is if you take two initial conditions to a dynamical system and run the evolution forward in time, the, the trajectories will rapidly separate in certain systems. So for example, um, one of the most famous systems is an ODE system called the Lorentz 63. Um, and this picture shows two trajectories whose initial condition is uh, essentially the same, but whose forward evolution separates uh, and becomes very different for longer times. Uh, this is a picture of a dye in fluid. Um, you can guess from the complexity of the picture that the, the motion of each individual speck of, of uh, dye in the fluid is, is chaotic. Um, so Lorentz 63, we actually do have a mathematically rigorous proof that this system is chaotic in the relevant parameter regimes. This was proved by uh, Tucker in, I think, 1999. Um, but uh, it's computer system proof and is very, very specific to Lorentz 63. It doesn't tell us how to, for example, deal with this higher dimensional system that Lorentz put forward in 1996, uh, which is you have a periodic set of unknowns. You have this simple quadratic nonlinearity. You have a simple uh, linear damping term and an external force. And uh, what you observe is that when epsilon is small, you observe uh, chaotic dynamics. Um, and it, it's actually, an, because the dimension is bigger, um, it's actually a nice benchmark system for a variety of analytical and numerical methods in applied mathematics. And maybe now it's considered a little bit too easy, um, but uh, certainly much harder than the original Lorenz 63. So this is the kind of dynamics we wanna get at. What, how do we understand this, this kind of chaotic dynamics? So here, uh, here are, you know, like a snapshot of two, two, two or three trajectories looks like um, that start the same, but become rapidly different. Okay, so um, let's say we have a dynamical system which takes values in some space M and forward evolution phi T that gives you a solution map. Then uh, what I'm going to consider, or it's very, not just me, very commonly considered for sensitivity with respect to initial condition is looking at how the Jacobian with respect to the initial data. So if you differentiate the flow map with respect to the initial condition, does this grow exponentially or not? So that's the question we wanna ask. So this is kind of a linearization of the idea that two particles, that's the two initial conditions that start close together separate about as fast as possible in a nice dynamical system. Uh, exponential will be as fast as possible. So for the purpose of this talk, I will call um, this Lyapunov exponent being strictly positive for almost every initial condition, I will call that chaotic 
Um, and it's extremely hard to verify that this is true on a positive measure set of initial conditions for deterministic systems. So we only have a few uh, either very low or special dimensional or special systems like Lorenz 63 or extremely rigid and not very physical um, kind, of math kind of mathematical constructs. Uh, and that's very frustrating because many systems that you observe in nature are actually chaotic or we observe them to be chaotic. So I'm gonna talk about the uh, long, the, you know, it's an old idea of maybe we can answer this question easier if we have stochastic forcing. So the dynamical system that I have in mind for this talk is I have a stochastic process on Rn and it solves this SDE and I'm gonna take additive forcing. So this X naught is a vector field um, and that contains the sort of deterministic part of my evolution. And here's my external forcing. These X k's are constant, so they, they don't depend on W. Some of the stuff that I'm talking about in the talk does actually extend to manifolds and multiplicative forcing and whatnot, but it doesn't matter for the purpose of this talk. This is the system I want to understand. Um, you, so for those of you who never worked with SDEs before, uh, you can make sense of this SDE. So that, you know this weird notation, if you're not familiar with it, it's, this notation is chosen because this, this is supposed to be a Brownian motion and this is supposed to be the time derivative of Brownian motion. It doesn't quite make sense. So it's supposed to be white noise. I mean, it's totally decorrelated in time. Um, and uh, so then this WT can't be differentiable. So you can't really make sense of it in the traditional ODE sense. Um, but that's okay because you can make sense of it as an integral equation. And uh, there's a long, uh, well, very well understood theory for making sense of stochastic differential equations. So there's no issue there. Um, it's essentially what you can say is that for every realization of these Brownian motions, so I'll refer to that as little omega, it's the noise path, the realization of the noise. Uh, more or less, you almost surely, are, I'm going to work under the assumption, or I'm going to work with systems, which you almost surely have global unique solutions of this uh, ODE. And so I get a flow map that takes me in, takes my initial conditions to solutions. But now the flow map is random. It depends on the noise path. Um, okay, so once you have uh, these, uh, this random flow map, you can make sense of the Markov semigroups. So this gives you uh, the evolutions on, for example, observables. So phi is a scalar question you could ask, like what is the energy? Um, and PT phi gives you the expectation of this uh, observable given that you know the initial condition. Um, and you can reconstruct this just by knowing the probability of finding your solution in a given set at a given time. The adjoint semigroup PT star gives you the evolution on mu, the, a, uh, where mu is any probability measure. So what this PT star says is that if you randomize the initial condition with respect to the measure mu, um, then PT star mu is the law of the solution. That's a function of time. Um, so a classical result in stochastic differential equations is that these semigroups actually solve PDEs. Um, and uh, so for example, PT is a semigroup generated by uh, an operator L, which is called the generator. Um, and I'm going to denote it like this. So here I'm using vector fields to mean differentiation in that direction. So uh, yeah, it's annoying when you first start using this notation, but then when you get used to it, it's very convenient. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so if you think about it like this, the, the deterministic part of this, uh, this generator is a transport part, first order transport equation, or first order transport like term. And the second order things are like diffusion. So these operators are sub elliptic. They are elliptic if the forcing spans the tangent space. Okay, um, so the next important con uh, concept I need to introduce is that of a stationary measure. So these are fixed points of the Markov semigroup PT star. And what this says is that if I randomize the initial condition with respect to mu, then the law doesn't change as a function of time. So if you've never, if you've never worked um, with uh, these kind of processes, you, you know, the solution of course is not stationary. So you should think of like the, if you go look at a river and look at the flow of water over a stone in a river, that's a kind of a statistical stationary situation like this. But that's what you should visualize. And uh, what's nice about stochastic systems is that it's not actually that, uh, it's not a very stringent assumption to assume that there is a unique stationary solution. And moreover that this stationary solution, uh, mu, um, is actually smooth, has a smooth density with respect to Lebesgue measure. Um, where in finite dimensional SDEs, this is not a stringent assumption. In fact, this is quite a commonplace. It's not always true, but it's... Um, and um, I'm not gonna talk too much about how to prove this, but basically you need two ingredients in general, and there's many versions, but two pieces that come together. You need some kind of regularization on the Markov semigroup, 
Um, and this is something that's not true, but deterministic systems. So in deterministic systems, transport equations won't map bounded functions to continuous functions, right? But random systems, they can. Um, and then you need something that says that, you know, the, the, the phase space isn't separated into two pieces. So you need some kind of irreducibility. These two come together and you can prove uniqueness. Uh, um, and what's beautiful about this is that then you can use the pointwise ergodic theorem to prove that for almost every noise realization and almost every initial condition, the long time average of the observable is equal to the ensemble average. That's sort of the physicist's idea of what ergodic should be. So time average equals ensemble average. Um, and uh, the fact that this is true kind of for almost every, for Lebesgue, almost every initial condition, everything like that, this, this is, I think, um, the main reason why stochastic systems are significantly more robust and easy to work with than random systems, or sorry, than, than uh, de um, deterministic systems. Okay, so now um, we're interested in understanding the Lyapunov exponents, which is not a scalar observable. So we need a more intense ergodic theorem to understand this uh, limit of the matrix. Um, so, in, in, you know, if it, so if it, think about it like this, this matrix, which I'll, I'll denote JT for Jacobian, it solves this ODE, where WT is uh, the solution to the SDE. Right. Um, so, um, you know, if this WT were independent of time, if it was just a fixed point, then spectral theory would tell you what are the possible exponential growth and decay rates of the solutions to this ODE, right? The Jordan canonical form would tell you something like this. So now the, we need a special ergodic theorem that can treat the case when WT is an SDE with a unique stationary measure. Um, and that's the multiplicative ergodic theorem proved by Oslo Dets in 68. It says a bunch of things and uh, just the easiest pieces are on the slide. Okay, so I highly encourage you to go check out the theorem. It's beautiful. And what, what's on the slide is easier than the, the real theorem. But one of the consequences is that there exists deterministic Lyapunov of exponents, such that almost surely with respect to the initial condition and noise path, you have these limits. Um, so both the exponential growth rate is perfectly well-defined and the exponential uh, compression and expansion of Lebesgue measure um, is perfectly well-defined. In fact, you get a whole spectrum of Lyapunov of exponents, but that's not, I'm gonna, not, not gonna talk about that today. And uh, of course, these guys are related uh, through this inequality. Um, so as you can see, uh, the existence of Lyapunov of exponents is actually not hard, or at least it's very, very solved. So that's not the interesting part of what I'm going to talk about. Um, the interesting thing is a more interesting thing is how do you actually estimate them? And they're hard because of a special kind of cancellation, which is sometimes called cone twisting. Uh, so let's consider a, a toy model. Let's think about taking IID two by two determinant one matrices and just multiplying them together. So I just look at this random matrix multiplication and ask, when does this random matrix multiplication grow exponentially? So you can come up with some examples that don't grow exponentially. So of course, if they're all a random rotation, you have no growth. Another case is where you have this uh, kind of random shearing, but it's only shearing in the same direction. It's important. Um, and then of course you get growth, but it's not exponential. The most interesting case is something like this. So imagine P is 0.99999, something like this. So most of the time you get this matrix that uh, doubles the X axis and compresses the Y axis. So most of the time it'll be like stretch, 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 compress, 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 compress. But then eventually you'll see this random rotate, sorry, it's not random. You'll see this rotation show up and the X and the Y axis will flip. And then all that expansion you build up will get canceled. And so this will not grow exponentially. So the Lyapunov exponent will be zero for any P that isn't exactly uh, one. Um, and that's pretty interesting. And of course you can imagine, okay, this is maybe not so hard to keep track of for random matrices, but for actual dynamical systems, you know, this means that you have to keep track of which cones are expanding and which cones are compressing for all time, for every, you know, on a positive measure set for all time. So that means uh, that for any kind of non-trivial system, it's going to be extremely hard. So that's why, uh, that's why, you, yeah, that's why it's really hard to, to prove positively up enough exponents in deterministic systems. So Furstenberg, um, gave uh, in his 1968 paper, he gave us a really beautiful reason why we should expect randomness to actually help us with this problem. Uh, and this is a, a really incredible, theory. I think it's a really incredible theorem because he proved that in this case of random matrices, these are the only three counterexamples, essentially. So what he proved is that if lambda is equal to zero, there's some change of basis, deterministic change of basis, such that you either are almost surely an isometry, 
or so, what, you know, you're basically an almost surely some kind of uh, random rotation or reflection, or you fix one subspace deterministically, or you fix two subspaces deterministically. Those are the only options. Um, and so you see, actually, there's a lot of rigidity to being volume preserving and yet not having exponential growth. So Furstenberg's theorem tells us this. Okay, the, both the proof and the statement suggest that uh, we need to keep track of uh, directions. So how, um, what, what are the directions of expansion and contraction? So Furstenberg suggested using what's called the projective process. So what you do is you take a, a, a vector on the sphere and you uh, apply the Jacobian to it, and then you normalize and put it back on the sphere. And uh, that's not a Markov process, but the, kept the coupled process, the WV, that's a Markov process that evolves on the sphere bundle. Um, and in fact, it's not just a Markov process, it's actually the solution to an SDE. So you can lift your vector fields from the base uh, space to the sphere bundle uh, with this lifting procedure like this. And you have a nice SDE, which has its own Markov semigroups, and it can have its own stationary measures. And so I'm going to work under the regime where there's a unique stationary measure for the ZT process. That turns out to be harder to check for a lot of concrete systems, but can be proved for some concrete systems that I'll talk about. Um, and, oh, and I'm going to assume that they're smooth. So I'm going to assume that the stationary measure has a smooth density with respect to Lebesgue measure on the sphere bundle. Uh, okay, so what is the point of this? Um, well, you can express formulas for the Lyapunov exponents in terms of the projective process. So the simplest one, which you can prove from the ergodic theorem, is if you choose the initial condition and the direction sort of randomly with respect to this measure, you can prove the Lyapunov exponent is this uh, kind of expectation. Um, now, if you look at this, there's a T here on this side of the equation and no T here. So one could ask is, well, if I kind of send time to zero, do I get some time infinitesimal information? Is there a time infinitesimal characterization? So the answer is yes. Um, this uh, formula is sometimes called furstenberg kazminsky but it's kind of an amalgamation of several papers and, on different things. But um, essentially what you can do is do what I just said and write a time infinitesimal version. And what's it's really nice about that is because it doesn't, you don't see the, uh, oops, you don't see phi t anywhere, which is nice because phi t is complicated. And these vector fields are explicit stuff that you can write down formulas for. This is of course not explicit, um, but you know, you can still uh, write down this formula. The problem with this is that this is a nice identity, which says um, kind of an intuitive fact, if you think about it, that volume compression in projective space is related to expansion of the Jacobian matrix. Um, but this is a, a nice identity, but it's really hard to do analysis because uh, these integrals are not sign definite. You're not gonna know what this is and uh, how, how can you do estimates with this kind of identity? I have no idea. So uh, unfortunately there is, not unfortunate, there is another formula for the Lyapunov exponents, which uh, you can do analysis, some analysis on, but it's really complicated. Uh, so let me explain it real quickly. <laughs> um, and so this, uh, this, some version of this is actually how Furstenberg Fersen, proved his, uh, his theorem about matrices. And uh, the version I'm writing now for SDEs is, is due to Baxendale. And so the, the point is that uh, you have this measure on the sphere bundle. So, but you can also think like, okay, for each point on the, the RN, there's a sphere. And then I could renormalize it so I have a measure on this sphere, right? So every sphere I have a renormalized measure. It's a conditional measure, a fiber measure, or whatever you want to call it. So it's, it's a disintegration of the of the new measure. Um, and everything I'm working with is smooth, strictly positive, whatever. So you just uh, you can just take the densities and divide them, and then you have a decent. And so it turns out that you can evaluate this Lyapunov exponent gap um, as the relative entropy between moving the base point around and pushing uh, this uh, sphere under this matrix action. This, uh, it's a pretty deep formula. Um, it's, it's not so easy to prove, but it's not maybe as hard as it looks to prove uh, in a sense. And this, this relative entropy isn't some magical thing. It's the same log that comes, it's the same log that's in the definition of the Lyapunov exponent. So it's not, it's not a mystical formula, but it's a pretty interesting formula that you, that you, that you can see. Um, and uh, it tells you something really powerful, which is that if, if the Lyapunov exponent gap is zero, then almost surely you have this kind of really uh, intense degeneracy. And the point is that for a lot of random systems, you can prove that this degeneracy is not possible. 
Um, and this is how Furstenberg proved his theorem. He, he basically classified um, all the matrix all the matrix subgroups that could fix a, a measure under the push forward. And that's what gives you use some rigidity of, of matrix subgroups and that proves your theorem. Um, and so there's a whole class of ideas called Ala Furstenberg, which use this this idea that if you're a volume preserving system, then not chaotic means you have a bunch of really strong, almost sure degeneracies. Um, and so actually Sam and Alex and I's first paper was to use this to study the particle trajectories in Navier-Stokes because, or incompressible Navier-Stokes because the flow map that was generated was volume preserving. And so even though it sounds like a really complicated sort of at least partially infinite dimensional system, uh, you can still use some version of Alan Furstenberg to prove, to prove that these particle trajectories are chaotic. Um, so when they apply, it's great. But unfortunately, two things. One, of course, it's not very quantitative. This thing is either equal to zero or it's not, e or sorry, this thing's either equal or not equal, right? And if it's not equal, you just, uh, I have no idea how to use the formula. I've never seen anyone use the formula uh, for other than this purpose. Um, and if, and in particular, if lambda sigma is equal to zero, then proving that this thing is not equal to this thing doesn't prove that this thing is positive, right? Lambda sigma could be negative, Okay, so lambda one can still be negative, right? Uh, and so that's that's the problem. And so we knew, uh, when, you know, we we trying to prove chaos for Lorentz ninety six, or we succeeded in proving chaos for Lorentz ninety six. We knew that this method wasn't going to work. So one of the things that we did was find a new formula for the Lyapunov exponents. Um, there's there's a there's another version or two of these Fisher information identities, um, but I'm just going to give you the one that we actually use, which is this one, which tells you that you can relate the Lyapunov exponent gap. Um, okay, yeah, there's this two here. It's not a, not important um, to a Fisher information of the stationary density. And the idea, of course, is look. This is a this is a relative entropy. You can imagine what if we just uh, take time to zero and get something time infinitesimal. Right? What is the time infinitesimal analog of this formula? If you've worked in, for example, kinetic theory or other fields, time, time derivatives of relative entropy should produce Fisher informations. So it does. Um, and so uh, yeah. Um, and the, the, yeah, okay. So this is the formula that we have and we scoured the literature. We could not find anyone who had written this down. Um, I'm not saying that no one had ever observed it. Maybe they just didn't know what it was useful for. Um, but uh, yeah, it turns out to be very useful at least for our purposes. So this formula is going to be useful for studying small noise limits because we want to make some kind of quantitative statement. So I'm going to now put a small parameter in front of my noise. And I'm also going to allow the, the deterministic and the noise vectors to depend slightly on epsilon, but they'll depend in a smooth way. Then uh, the Fisher information identity becomes something like this. Not like this, it becomes exactly this. Um, and the advantage, of course, is that it's time infinitesimal. So it's directly on the stationary measure. So it doesn't involve the random map phi t or anything like that. And this integrand is not negative. So that's great. But it only, it only, uh, depends on, it only involves derivatives and directions in which the forcing acts. And so you might naturally ask, um, oh, and I should, I should emphasize that even if you force every direction in the base space, you, of course, you won't get all the tangent space directions in the sphere bundle in general. So for example, this talk, I'm talking about additive noise. And so you don't get any new directions. You don't get any directions in the sphere in the tangent space of the sphere bundle. So yeah, unfortunately we have to deal with manifolds even if you don't want to. So <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, and so this doesn't go, this is not going to be a regularity. It's not going to directly relate some kind of sub space to the Lyapunov exponent gap. It just, it just doesn't. And so this is what prompts us to uh, think about the notion of hypoelipticity, which would allow us to bridge that gap. So uh, the notion of hypoelipticity, which I guess you think of as, at least in the context of Kolmogorov equations, is how do you get regularization of the semigroups, for example, if you don't have ellipticity, if you just have sub ellipticity. Um, so th the idea that this was possible, um, I, I think the first paper is due to Kolmogorov actually in the thirties, um, but um, it was um, Hermander in 1967 who codified basically a sharp condition for how to check this. So it's a complicated condition. So suppose I have a collection of vector fields on a manifold and Z naught is the kind of deterministic guy. So just think of that as the vector field that tells you how your deterministic dynamical system evolves. I'm gonna check the first level is just the noise directions. And then each next level is I'm gonna commute the vector fields from the last level with those of uh, Z naught through ZR. 
And remember, these vector fields, they're differential operators. So I'm commuting something that looks like A dot grad with something that looks like B dot grad. And I'm commuting it around and I get a new first order differential operator that has to do with the derivatives of A and the derivatives of B, right? So I keep doing this, I get more vector fields that just involve higher and higher derivatives of the coefficients, essentially. Um, and the parabolic Ramondo condition says that if I do this, play this stupid game enough, then enough, and I, then it means that every point in the manifold, I can find a linear combination that spans the tangent space. You can see that it's a strict enhancement of asking that the generator is elliptic, because the generator being elliptic would be that I don't have to take any of these stupid commutators. Right. Uh, and uh, one of the consequences of, of Hermander's work is that, for example, if these lifted twiddle vector fields are hypoelliptic, so if they satisfy the parabolic Hermander condition, then PT twiddle is instantly regularizing. That's a consequence of the theorem. And so I'll, I'll refer to this condition that these X twiddles satisfy this complicated parabolic Hermander condition as projective PHC, so the projective parabolic Hermander condition. So this, uh, if we have projective parabolic Hermann condition, it actually allows us to use the PDE to relate the derivatives in the forcing direction to derivatives in all directions. So this is the technical, really ugly technical piece. Um, so essentially, this is the idea. Um, the stationary measure satisfies this sub-elliptic PDE, L twiddle star, so it's like, it's like a fucker plank like equation, right? It's on this annoying sphere bundle thing, but it's still, it's like a fucker plank equation. Right? Um, and it's, it's a probability measure. It's an integral one smooth function. And so it solves a PDE, a nice explicit PDE. This L twiddle star, it depends on epsilon. There's an epsilon in front of all the second order terms. So F hence depends on epsilon. So the question is what uniform a priori estimates can you get on this? Uh, on this equation? Well, the answer is actually um, probably none, but if someone came down and told you, hey, I have a bound on the Fisher information, uh, what other a priori estimates can you deduce from that? And the, the fact is this a priori estimate. So what you can say is if you have some kind of projective parabolic Kormander, then on bounded sets, uh, I, can, I can estimate a L1 type Sobolev regularity above by just using the Fisher information in a way that does not depend on epsilon. So S doesn't depend on epsilon and C doesn't depend on epsilon. That's really crucial. So F depends on epsilon. The generator L twiddle star that depends on epsilon, but uh, nothing about this a priori estimate does. And this, uh, you don't need to worry about. This is like a, how would you take fractional derivatives? It kind of, uh, you know, think of doing like a, like a finite difference of your, of, your, of your function and asking that the finite difference doesn't scale like H, but instead like H to the S star. And then you have to integrate over all these directions. It's not important. It's some fractional regularity. So you don't get a whole derivative in all directions, but you get some fraction of a derivative in all directions. And so the point is that now, if you have this, if you have this parabolic Hermann condition, then you do get what I claimed, what I said you didn't get on the previous slide, where you do get actually a, a simple, regularity class related to the Lyapunov exponent gap of your system. Right? And epsilon is explicitly appearing here. These guys depend on epsilon, of course, but the, the, C doesn't. Then the proof of this theorem is, it's actually kind of going back to Hermanner's original paper um, and uh, switching it to kind of an L1 framework rather than an L2 framework, which some steps are totally trivial to generalize and other steps are, are not. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about, I'm not talking about the infinite dimensional Navier-Stokes equations, but let me bring them up because right, I really like them. So I'm talking, just gonna talk about the 2D incompressible Navier-Stokes equations. So um, if you don't know what they are, it's okay. Just take this as given. So what you have is a scalar field called the vorticity. So I'll refer to this as W. It's the curl of the physical velocity field in space. And it solves a scalar equation. This is in two dimensions on a periodic box. Um, you have this transport-like nonlinearity which uh, the velocity field comes from W with this non-local operator. And then you have this damping term here, and then you have a forcing. So the system from a PDE perspective, I mean, it's not hard to prove global existence and stuff like that. That's well-behaved qualitatively, but we don't basically know anything about it at all when epsilon goes to zero. If you, well, if you send time to infinity and then epsilon to zero, you don't know anything about it. 
Okay, so um, I'm going to make an, an SDE out of this. So the first thing you can do is take this system and take the Fourier transform. So you express W in a Fourier series and then re rewrite the system as a question about the each Fourier coefficient. This gives this kind of SDE. So this is the damping term, this is the forcing term, and the nonlinearity is just this quadratic polynomial with some coefficients, which crucially are rational. Um, and uh, I've rescaled the system. So you have a small parameter here, but uh, because the L2 norm of W is conserved, when epsilon goes down to zero, this solution will explode. So you have to rescale it to keep it, to keep it bounded. Uh, and so that rescaling comes here. So that's how we have a small noise limit. Um, and so the idea is that if I, if I want to turn this into an SDE, all I do is chop W off in some square. I just say, I'm gonna ignore all the high Fourier coefficients and I'm just going to get an SDE for the first 1 trillion Fourier coefficients. So I'm just gonna chop it off in a square. And so our theorem is that if the forcing is hypoelliptic for the W process, which um, uh, Wayne on uh, and Jonathan Mattingly and then Martin and Jonathan, they figured out sharp, sharp conditions for how to characterize how many alphas and betas you need for that. You need four, I think. Um, then uh, for all sufficiently high dimensional truncations, uh, you have a uh, top Lyapunov exponent, which is strictly positive for all epsilons sufficiently small. And you have this probably very suboptimal uh, quantitative uh, lower bound. Um, and it, the important thing is, of, of course, as I said, existence is not really the hard part. Um, it's the strict positivity. And you can also check that if epsilon is large, the, neg the Lyapunov exponent is negative. That's, that's relatively easy to check. So you, you need epsilon small so that the nonlinearity becomes dominant in order to see the, 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 the chaos. Okay, so is this the first kind of quantitative estimate? Of course not. Um, it's the first one on Navier Stokes, but uh, there were existing quantitative estimates on simpler systems. And these papers, um, they get e exact asymptotic expansions for the Lyapunov exponent as epsilon goes down to zero. So that they're rather sophisticated papers that apply some really uh, clever and powerful ideas to simpler models. Um, but it, the thing is, they basically deduce an almost exact understanding of what this projective stationary measures are. And this very on, we realized was impossible for something like Navier-Stokes. So we just gave up on that and be like, okay, those methods will never work. Um, can we have a method that's robust? The only method we knew of that was really robust was Ala Furstenberg, but it also doesn't apply because the system's not volume preserving. Uh, because Lee, you can check that lambda sigma because the nonlinearity is volume preserving, which is important. But the, the damping term makes a compression in phase space like epsilon times the trace of A, where A is the, uh, the discretization of the Laplacian. Um, and so those methods don't apply. Uh, and so that what prompted us to go through this Fisher information. And it's basically three steps. So the first step is you have to prove this projective parabolic chromatic condition. And that was done actually by Sam and I in a follow-up paper. Um, then once you have that, then you do some PDE stuff and some SDE stuff, and you verify all these qualitative conditions that I basically didn't even mention. Um, there's a whole list of them, but they're not hard to check once you have projective parabolic chromatic. Then, then you say, okay, I checked all these qualitative conditions, then I can apply this Fisher information lower bound. And the point is that the, the damping term epsilon times trace of A is just basic, you know, when you divide by epsilon, that becomes one, basically. Um, and so I get some WS1 regularity, lower bounding lambda one divided by epsilon. So I say, okay, if lambda one divided by epsilon were actually bounded, I have to prove that this is somehow a contradiction. Okay, so that's step three. And so we use this three-step process to prove that Lorenz 96 in sufficiently high dimensions um, was uh, chaotic in our first paper with Alex. Um, the, the difference, of course, is that the proving projective PHC for Lorenz 96, one could do by hand with just some fiddling around with some simple matrices, whereas Navier Stokes, yeah, that was a whole different story to, uh, to check that. Okay, um, so how do we check it for Navier Stokes? Let me just say, uh, a few words. So the first thing is, you know, Hermoner condition, it's on these horrible vector fields. And if you go look at the vector fields, you're like, that's horrible. It just looks awful, right? Um, and so you have to reduce it to a question that isn't terrible. And it turns out that with a bunch, with enough fiddling, you can, it turns out, so of course, this is about a Lie algebra, right? You're taking com commutators and linear combinations. But it turns out that because the geometry is flat, uh, the face space, the bottom geometry is flat and you have certain other nice structures, you can reduce 
to, you can reduce checking parabolic chromatic condition to checking something about one specific Lie algebra, which happens to come from, if you take the second derivative of this, you know, if you look at this quadratic, if you look at this quadratic polynomial, um, you just, you can make some matrices out of these coefficients and this condition that L equals K plus J. You have a family of trace-free matrices that are explicit with real coefficients. And you ask, uh, does this Lie algebra generate all uh, trace-free matrices? So can you generate any trace-free matrix by taking enough commutators and linear combinations? I have no, we have no idea how to check that by hand for Navier-Stokes. We can check it by hand for Lorentz 96. For Navier-Stokes, we uh, did some work. We proved that you can actually, uh, yeah, we reduce it to uh, a question about non-solvability of some polynomials with integer coefficients and then used uh, computational algebraic geometry to, to check it. So it was a bunch of, uh, of reductions and it's one of the only papers I've written that actually has absolutely zero analysis in it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I don't think there's a single inequality. Uh, <laughs> so at least not a functional inequality. Um, okay, so yes, it, it is a computer assisted proof, but it's one that works on all sufficiently high dimensions. Uh, okay, so now uh, once you have the projective parabolic chromander, now you want to, to prove somehow that there's something wrong with this lower, with this upper bound. And that's obviously a crucial step for the method. <laughs> um, and I would say it's not obvious that there's anything wrong with this a priori estimate. Um, so if you have such an a priori estimate that the stationary measure of the projective process is you know, uniformly bounded in some low regularity class, then for example, you can prove, you can use this to prove that, um, that F converges strongly in L1. So we have some tightness at the infinity and things like that. And, and you can prove that actually you can pass the limit and construct an L1, uh, so absolutely continuous invariant measure for the deterministic process. So this is, uh, now there's no noise and there's no damping. You just have the, they're called the 2D Euler equations. Um, and you've lifted them to the, to the sphere thing and you're looking at that projective process. It turns out that there's a lemma. So you have to use deterministic dynamical systems, um, which is, uh, I mean, I guess in some ways unfortunate, but in some ways uh, inevitable. Um, where, uh, Basically, because you don't have noise to cancel things out as you evolve, if you have any unbounded growth of d of d phi t on a positive measure set, then you can't have an L1 invariant measure for the for the deterministic projective process. So basically, what this tells you is that all you actually have to do is prove that d phi t grows on a on a positive measure set in phase space. Um, for Navier-Stokes and for Lorenz ninety six, it turns out that that's relatively easy to check because of the scaling invariance of the nonlinearity, you can actually prove this somewhat magical looking identity. Whereas that if you, if you take the derivative of the flow map in the direction of the solution itself, you can check this formula for that uh, Jacobian. And uh, yeah, it's, it comes from the fact that the nonlinearity is a perfect quadratic polynomial. Um, so it comes from the scaling invariance of the, of the nonlinearity. Um, and uh, and uh, I think you maybe also use uh, the fact that uh, bxx dot x is equal to zero. That that's the energy conservation law. Uh, b b here is the quadratic polynomial that makes the denominator work. And so okay, you have a t here, and by fiddling around, you can use this to prove that you have growth on, on a positive measure set. Um, okay, so I would say. Uh, we threw out a lot of stuff, you could say, by, you know, we have this rather specific quantitative bound and we just used it to get L1 compactness. So in some sense, we threw out some quantitative information that is potentially useful. Um, I don't know how to use that information right now. And even so, using this three-step um, kind of compactness rigidity or compactness contradiction argument was also hard. It's not, it didn't seem that hard for these equations, but the thing is steps one and or three um, can be hard. And in fact, for some examples that we wanted to apply this method is, it's actually false. So for example, projective parabolic chromander condition just isn't automatically always true for every physical system, okay? Um, and uh, right, so there's a lot of room for improvements even if you just wanna use steps one, two, three. So for example, um, proving growth of the deterministic dynamical system can actually be hard. It was easy for Navier-Stokes, but that's because we got lucky. Um, 
So you, we have so, I mean, uh, several stacks of problems where if you could give me this growth, I could prove these Lyapunov exponent things, but uh, we don't know how to prove the growth. Um, and so we want to get a better tool or better techniques for this. Um, I don't think our quantitative lower bound is necessarily the best you could get, um, at least, especially if you specify more information. And uh, our proof of parabolic Hermander condition, it, it does work on other Galerkin truncations of PDEs with polynomial nonlinearities. But if you give me other systems, well, it may not be always so easy to check this Hermander condition just because there was, well, it was not easy to check, but we know how to do it, at least in this case. But in other cases, and the question, of course, you really want to know are, can you do it in infinite dimensions? No. Um, I don't know how to do that yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. And, and now in case there are some, some questions, maybe they can be submitted on, on Discord. Yeah, Laura. Huh. J Jacob, may I ask you to repeat the question? Oh, yeah, yeah, I will. So do you expect this uh, Lyapunov exponent lambda one to measure in some sense uh, the, the mixing of the in the flow, not just the fact that this is unstable, but really that you have uh, real mixing? Uh, right, okay, so for those online who I think they could not hear, so uh, she was asking, um, if, uh, if I expect the lambda one to measure not just the kind of infinitesimal separation, but also the, the mixing, uh, so uh, the sort of more global uh, chaotic dynamics. Um, uh, yes and no. So I expect, so there, there are, so if, if you're talking about Navier-Stokes, um, be, be, because the nonlinearity conserves entropy shells, uh, I think that it cannot, well, you can prove that the, okay, the short answer is, I don't know. Maybe the, <laughs> the longer answer is there's no easy way to relate um, this Lyapunov exponent to like the quenched correlation decay. So like the almost sure exponential decorrelation, there's no easy way to make this quantitative comparison. Um, so you need positive Lyapunov, need, need positive Lyapunov exponents to get the strong, the strong correlation decay. And I think that we, I think you do automatically get strong correlation decay just from the positivity of Lyapunov exponents, but the, making the quantitative comparison is, is hard. There's no general method for making this uh, quantitative. Um, so for example, the other piece of information that you need is, or that, that comes in is the spectral gap of the projective Markov semigroup. And this you can pretty much show is, well, the Markov semigroup for the, Lyap, for the Navier Stokes, never mind the projective one, you can prove the spectral gap is order epsilon. So you can actually prove that it's exactly scales like epsilon. Um, that was actually a paper by my graduate student, former graduate student and I, Kyle Wilson, you know. And uh, so that, uh, that is slower than the Lyapunov time. But you, you would kind of expect that on the entropy shells, or at least you kind of expect that it does go faster, but I don't no idea how to do that. I think that's a deep question. Yeah. I don't know if that helped or hurt. <laughs> Uh, any, but any other questions? Martin. Um, I was just wondering if you could say a few words on the intuition of the meaning of the parabolic term and the condition for the projective process. Mm -hmm. and for example, I mean, does it relate to term and the condition for, for example, the two point motion or K point motion or something like that? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. So for, for people who are, who are um, heard online or who, who, are, who are online. So um, he asked um, if the parabolic Hermander condition could be related to, for example, the, the um, Hermander condition for the two point process or the K point motion. Um, it's so uh, I know from previous things that the, 
the parabolic hormonal condition for the projective process is very closely related to the, just the hormonal condition for the two-point process. Um, are they exactly equivalent? They are equivalent. I think they are equivalent sort of in neighborhood, in the neighborhood. Um, so like if, uh, if the two-point, what am I trying to say? Yeah, yeah, I think they're, yeah, I think they're, 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 they're equivalent sort of locally. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and we actually prove a stronger, I glossed over this, but this Lie algebra condition that we use is actually stronger, stronger than projective hypolipticity. It actually gives you kind of hypolipticity of the full matrix process, not just the, the one direction, but um, which is actually useful for other things potentially. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah, I, I, th I, th I think they're equivalent locally. Is there another question? It would be nice to, uh, either from the audience online or the live audience. Well, there, there could be a question if it has time, yeah. So if you look at uh, stochastic differential equations you did, and you look at the first linearization, which is what you're doing, but you, then you renormalize it, there's some relation between the girls of the derivative, the norm of the, the linearized solution along the solution, if you average over time, if that behaves quite well in LP or something, then you do have uh, the flow. So the nice, the, the things stay together, but not for large T, you, you don't know for large T. For large T will be something a bit stronger. So I'm just wondering, this, uh, in that approach, the linearity equation, I don't, you see, you don't see the Lyotard point of view opponents, but you see something about the endpoint motion. You mean, uh, is there some relation there? Sorry, do, do, do you mean like, is there a relationship between the kind of like the finite time we open of exponents and the end particle motion yeah, yeah. for finite time? Jacob, um, we are, Jake, Jacob, we are essentially out of time. So can you yeah, okay. brief, brief answer? Okay. Uh, okay. Right, okay, so a uh, quick answer is, um, yeah, uh, so there's, you can relate the moment Lyapunov exponents directly to the dynamics of the two point particle motion. Um, higher, higher particle pairs, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you, what you need for that. Um, but yeah, for the two point particle motion, the moment Lyapunov exponents, so that's, uh, that's where you, oh, I can't control this. So that's where in, um, instead of taking almost sure limit, you put an expectation sign in the definition of the Lyapunov exponent. And it keeps track of kind of like, what's the probability that you are, it's a kind of a large deviation estimate in a sense on the finite time Lyapunov exponents kind of. Um, and this this the, has an explicit, uh, it's explicitly related to the spectral gap uh, of the second, uh, of, of the two particle motion. Let, let, let me thank Professor Bedrosian for his most fascinating lecture. And, and also the members of the live audience and the audience who attended on Zoom. So th thank you all very much. Bye, bye, bye. bye. Yes. Professor Bolobash, thank you very much for all the help.